Hey Taurus sisters, it is Amy Kay. Welcome, I'm glad you're here. In this episode, I'm gonna encourage those of you who are waiting for your husbands, your parents, your grown children, your, your Sunday church pastors, your Sunday church friends, if you're waiting for them to come to Torah, I'm gonna give you an encouragement that as that process starts to happen, and I believe it will for most of these people that we love, they will come to Torah, that there will be um, a period of time where they need to withdraw or something hard might happen in, in their lives that gives them time to study the Bible and to do that academic work that has to happen for most, most of us for, for them to come to a place of keeping Torah and to be patient and even encouraging through those times. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of my own story. But first, I just re wanna remind you, go to TorahSisters.com. There's a lot there. And especially go to the store, download all of the free stuff. Be sure to check out the magazine. The magazine comes out every two months. I mail it to your home. It is the best thing that I have at least try one issue and if you don't want to continue with it i you know email me or you can cancel your subscription anytime there's no long-term commitments i also have a book for sale that i just wrote called 30 day sabbath challenge it's mostly to give to christians or if you're still learning sabbath and i added a clearance section um stuff that i'm like discontinuing i just need to clear out the inventory so check out the clearance section in the store and 2024 is almost here. I have a 2024 planner, like a big, huge spiral bound planner that can help you plan out your weeks, your months. And in the back, there's plenty of room to plan out feasts. There's lots of notes pages. A lot of you use those to plan ahead for the feasts. Um, there's even a period tracker page and prayer requests and prayer answers. To, and it's just chocked full of stuff and it's on sale <laughs> it's on sale because i want you to have it as the gregorian new year approaches so back to this topic of when people are coming to torah sometimes they need time to withdraw and sometimes um if it's your husband as a wife you have to give them that time and sometimes the father <laughs> the creator of the universe intervenes and makes time for them and a lot of us have already been through this and sometimes it's painful the way he makes time is not always pleasant and we'll talk about some of those um, in a minute but first I want to start with some scripture there's um, a lot of scriptures that talk about patience and affliction and things like that but Psalm 119 really came to mind and there's so many verses in there but I'm gonna just read some of them that talk about when it comes to meditating on the law it takes time to do that in meditation um, I don't mean the kind of meditation where you empty your thoughts and you're useless, <laughs> but the kind of meditation where you're, you're just stopping. You're just going to stop and be still and dwell on what is good and talk to the Father and read scripture, recite scripture in your head. And that takes time. So let's see what David has to say. Verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And I started that with that verse because that's what we want for the, for a lot of you. It's your husbands. You want them to come to Torah or, you know, all these other people that you love. And that's what you want. You want their eyes to be opened. So he says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Verse 27, make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous works. 48. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. 54, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. 55, I remember your name in the night, O Yehovah, and keep your law. It's not just when it's convenient. Sometimes when we need, when the Father, when we need to be meditating on the law, the father will wake us up during the night. <laughs> so that's what is happening to David here too. Verse 62, at midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. 92, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Verse 147, 148, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. David made time. 
and it probably wasn't always convenient. <laughs> but when it comes to meditating on the law that leads to righteous living, he took the time. So we all have really unique stories of how the Father gave us time when we were coming to Torah. I will tell you that part of my story. Um, a lot of you have heard my testimony. I think I have a podcast with my Torah story on it. But I'll just focus in on that part where, you know, I had to do some studying. I had to do what I call academic study, like literally looking at the words on the pages of scripture, comparing them in context um, to the whole chapter, the whole book, other books in scripture, cross-referencing, you know, learning how to use an interlinear, looking at commentaries and watching videos and, you know, what do people say on both sides of the issue. All of that took I don't even know how many hours. <laughs> I wasn't counting the hours, probably hundreds of hours I spent. And I did it in a very short amount of time. I just, I couldn't stop. I just had to, I had to know. And so for me, it was just, I don't know, I think maybe two or three months until I was decided, yes, Torah is for us today. But that, and you, and, so, and, and everybody's story is different. And there's no, one story is not better than another. Like if, if you studied for six months and it, I guess, took you longer, I that whatever, I'm not in a contest with you. It does not matter. Sometimes I feel like people posture with their stories, but it's not our story. It's what the Father did in us. He opened our eyes. So here's what happened. Because I had three very small children. This was 10 years ago. They were all I, very small. I can't remember how old, maybe maybe like five, six, and eight years old. And it started with, this is so crazy, it started in the December of 2013. 2013 is when um, I first heard about this Torah Sabbath stuff being for go look it up in scripture. And um, I was intrigued. And that's when it all started. That's when the father planted the seed. And Right after that, I'm talking probably the very next day, was what we all call here the great ice storm of 2013, or some people call it the Christmas storm of 2013, because it was right before Christmas time. It was probably like December 23rd or 22nd. And it just knocked power out in practically the, the entire state. I was living in the woods. <laughs> we had 10 acres of woods and just trees everywhere fell on the lines and I mean, it was national news. I think it was worldwide news. A man in my little tiny town of Shasburg died because a power line was in his backyard and it was dark. He didn't know. And that that made national news. It was just a horrific storm. And so, of course, we lost power. Our power was off for, I think, eight days. And we were one of the longest ones to be without power. And we're not that far from Lansing, but we are kind of on the edge of different, anyway, eight days days so we stayed in our home we had a wood stove so we all slept in the part of the home that had the wood heat and <laughs> we literally melted snow on the wood stove to flush the toilets i do think we went to ymcas and our parents houses to take showers and we would run to meyer and buy bottled water to drink and um we just made the most of it it just turned into this little family adventure and uh, i think I don't know. We, we ate food. Like, no, nobody starved. We were fine. I think we cooked on the wood stove as well, some, and we went out to eat some. So we didn't like totally live off grid, but it was definitely different <laughs> and challenging. And it was quiet. And I was sort of suffering because I really wanted internet. So the father had just planted this seed, especially about Christmas, because it was right before Christmas. What does the Bible, like, I knew enough that this person posting the stuff on Facebook um, was challenging Christmas being pagan. And so the internet was off and I couldn't go look things up. And I was just mostly alone with God in my Bible thinking about what if she's right? <laughs> and also wanting to prove her wrong because I thought she was going to hell for keeping Sabbath. And so... But for that whole week, no internet, I just had to sort of sit and stew about it. Or what you might say, meditate on the whole issue at hand and just talk to God and do what David is saying. 
show me your statutes, teach me your precepts so I can walk the way you want me to walk. And so eventually the power came on and then I was just studying like crazy, especially then you have access to all the online commentaries and everything and, and the videos and everything, um, which then opened up even more things to look at and I needed more time. Well, the... Um, so God gave me a week right now. Most people would say, oh, that's terrible. The power was out for eight days. It was awful. But I look back at that time and I'm thankful for it because he needed, I needed that time for him to soften my heart, I think, and be open, I guess, to the possibilities or the direction he wanted me to go to start studying it out. I wasn't convinced yet, but I, he gave me time in the most unexpected and really painful way. <laughs> Like, um, it was not a fun time because we were not really set up for being off grid, but I'm thankful for it. So there is one example of an unexpected, by the world standards, you would say, that's awful, but it was part of his plan for giving me time. So I want, I just want you to start thinking about this. If you're praying for your husband or someone else in your life to come to Torah, when something unexpected happens before you freak out and get angry and even maybe try to fix it too much, just think, is this going to lead someone in my life to Torah? Is this disruption, what you think is a disruption, might be God giving your husband time. All right, so he gave me that week to sit and stew about it, but then I needed even more time. I had already realized I need to read the Bible cover to cover. Um, I wanted to do it as fast as possible. I wanted to know what the scripture said, but I also wanted to go online and read all these commentaries and, and see different points of view. And um, I, I just prayed that God would give me the time. Now, here's what happened next. It was the worst winter it's ever. There was more ice storms. And the Sunday church we were attending was also... Um, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and church was just canceled over and over and over. I mean, we had some Sunday services, but there were so many Sundays where, you know, the church lost power, or the roads were too icy, or something. And so they just canceled church. And I remember being so happy that church was canceled. So I had time to read my Bible. And church for me back then was a long Sunday because we were on a worship team and we did all these things. And so church was like hours and hours. So to get that time uh, was really precious, especially because my husband would be home on Sundays from work. And so then I could spend more time reading because he would hang out with the kids more. So uh, it was just crazy. It was crazy. What a coincidence how much church was canceled that winter. Another thing that happened uh, see, we were really, I was, we were both really involved in church and we were heavily involved in children's ministry. So Wednesday night, you know, Awana um, and just all of it. We were there for a long time <laughs> on Wednesdays. Well, strangely, early in the winter and nobody still to this day, I don't think knows how this happened, but someone in the, there's like, there was like what we call the children's wing of the church. It was just classrooms and Awana and Sunday school down at that end of the church. Someone somehow left the drinking fountain on. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. But this little tiny drinking fountain flooded that whole children's wing so badly that there was no children's ministry for, gosh, I think it was like eight weeks or longer. That's a long time. There was no Sunday school and there was no Awana. <laughs> that gave me again so much more time to read my Bible. <laughs> and, and it had never, that had never happened before. To my knowledge, it hasn't happened since. What a fluke, right? And I'll make air quotes over here because it was not a coincidence. To everyone else, it was this tragedy and this horrible thing. And, and I'm just over here like, yay, I get more time to read my Bible. I'm still convinced that all of that was for me. So, it was just, I look back and I'm just amazed at how God provided me time because I needed it. Because I still then, you know, had to take care of the kids and homeschool and, and all of these things. And, but 
he made time. And so by Passover, I just, I did Passover. Like I decided shortly before Passover that this is what he wants me to do. So I'm thankful for the disruption. I'm thankful for those little disasters in our life that he used it for a lot of good. Um, there, there are so many stories I've heard like this because I really pay attention to this part of people's Torah stories because it's such a little miracle. Uh, there's no such thing as a little miracle, right? A miracle is a miracle. But um, a lot of you know Ann Elliot from Homeschooling Torah. Part of her testimony is that she was really ill. And um, as the father was opening her eyes to Torah, she was so ill, she was stuck on the couch for weeks. She couldn't get up hardly. She couldn't do anything. Well, what are you going to do? You know, the father led her to scripture and put the right people in and all, you know, he just worked it all out, <laughs> but she needed time. And so he gave her time in the form of illness. And that's a big one. A lot of us would say illness is always bad. And it's definitely part of the curse. I'm not saying that illness is good, but um, the father can use it. So if, if someone, let, uh, I just will keep using the example of your husbands because I know we care about them the most. If you're a husband, if you've been praying for your husband to come to Torah and he suddenly breaks his leg <laughs> and has surgery and he can't get off the couch and um, don't freak out. Just keep that Bible close by on the coffee table and see if he picks it up, you know. Um, keep a playlist on the YouTube of some, you know, videos about Torah or something. But, but maybe, just maybe, this disruption in his life is from the creator of the universe, giving him time to answer your prayers. So don't freak out when these disruptions when these disruptions come. Another disruption that I've heard is people getting laid off, men or women getting fired or laid off for a time. And at that time, also God is pricking their heart and they start studying and reading their Bible. And they, that time brings them to Torah. So even something as devastating as a loss of a job can actually be part of the father's plan. Um, it could also be a vacation. Maybe someone takes a vacation and instead of doing the usual vacation things, they use that time to be still with God and to open their Bible. Um, sometimes people, and this might be happening now, I think, especially is people are finding th themselves broke. <laughs> and so they might be canceling some of their Netflix or their, their cable TV or their Amazon, and then looking to do something more affordable maybe they open their Bible because now they have more time because they're not watching television. There's so many ways in which the Father can give us time. Here's another one I've heard from a couple of women is that um, when they have a new baby and um, they have to spend a lot of time sitting while they breastfeed. <laughs> that gives them time. You can't be up and doing things much when you're breastfeeding, especially when they're young. It's just, you know, you mostly sit and it gives them time to study and to read and to watch videos and things. Or maybe you're caring for an, uh, an elder. Maybe you're, uh, someone is a caregiver for aging parents. Or maybe you're, someone's at the bedside of someone and someone's in the hospital and they're sitting at the bedside, or maybe they're in the hospital. Uh, another example of people who have a lot of time on their hands and God uses it to bring them into truth are um, people who are in jail. Um, people who are incarcerated have time on their hands. And the Father, full of grace and mercy, sometimes uses that to bring people close to Him in a way that they may have never drawn close to Him without that time. And of course, all the other stuff going on in their life too. Even COVID... How many of you know people who during COVID opened their Bibles? And COVID was a really, I think we're, we'll be learning lessons from COVID for a very long time. And it's not all bad. Some good things happened during COVID. You know, the big movement, women um, were staying home and it made them reassess their priorities. Like, what's important to me? What am I doing with my life? And as soon as things stopped, and we were all more still, it makes you have time to think. 
And then that allows, you know, how does the Bible describe God's voice? It's often a still, small voice, which requires quiet. And so COVID gave a lot of people quiet for a while. And they returned to the old ways in so many things. And a lot of them, a lot of people opened their Bibles. So even something as terrible as a pandemic and the overreaction to the pandemic, God used that. So I'm not saying that all of these things, illness, incarceration, pandemics, are, or layoffs are good. But when they happen, sisters, it might be that God is doing something amazing in someone's life. It might be disruptive to you, and this event might be a hardship for you, but embrace it and walk through it um, with dignity in a manner honoring Yeshua, and also keep in the back of your mind, it might not be about you. The whole disruption might be so that someone else in your life is coming to Torah. Uh, there's people in the Bible who had to have a stop. Now, we all stop every Sabbath, but I'm talking like a long stop. Some examples are Joseph had to have some time alone. Moses had time alone. These people had some serious time alone before God revealed the next part of his plan and, and used them in the next part of his plan. So Joseph had to have that time alone. Moses, King David... Uh, Elijah, the disciple John, of course, Paul had time alone, and the most obvious, Yeshua had time alone um, before God used them in the next part of God's plan. Not everything is about us. It's about us doing the kingdom work that he wants us to do. So be ready to embrace the unexpected stops, and the hard ones, even the painful ones. Um, and be patient. If it's your husband especially, be patient with him. If he's starting to dig into the word or watch YouTubes or learn or open books about this topic, you got to be patient with him and even encourage it and give him time. Even if the, the lawn doesn't get mowed as frequently as, all, as usual or you think he's neglecting some of his duties, man, if it's because he's digging into the word of God, it's okay. You're not raising grass. <laughs> You're raising kids. Let him spend that time with a father and encourage it. And don't get in the middle of it. Don't meddle. Don't say, oh, you're reading the wrong book first. You should read Genesis first. If he's reading, he's reading. If um, he's watching this video, but you don't think that one's quite right, don't be like, oh, that one's, you know, I don't like that one. Watch this guy instead. Get out of God's way. And just let now, if he comes to you with questions, give a polite, honest answer. But otherwise, I, th I think from most stories I've heard, get out of the way um, and make a way. Allow him that time. Maybe take over some of his household duties for a time. Now, is it okay for a man to neglect his family and to neglect his duty of taking care? Of course not. You know, I've seen what I think is nonsense, crazy men on Facebook sometimes. And it's another reason I'm not in any Facebook groups anymore, but I've seen, I've seen men say crazy things like, my whole thing is God told me to be a watchman on the wall. So um, I'm looking for a wife who ha has a career so she can take care of me so I can do God's work. And I'm like, no, I don't think that's right. That is not what I'm talking about. But if you're a husband, um, just need some extra time, give him extra time. Um, so be okay with things slowing down. Even cancel events. If he's really into studying and reading scripture, offer an out for certain events. Are there things that is in your life that you can just put on hold? Even if you, let's say you paid for, I don't know, karate lessons or cooking classes, or he paid for this to sign him up for that. Offer it out. Say, you know, honey, I don't care if you don't go to that. And he might say, well, we won't get our deposit back. It's okay. What you're doing is worthwhile. Uh, so be open to radical things that give him time to study. And this might go on for weeks or a few months. It just depends on him and how the spirit is working in him. 
So I will close with a couple more verses from Psalm 119, verses 71 and 72. David said, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I think that's the perfect verse to sum this up. So again, that's verses 71 and 72. Go and read that whole chapter if you're going through this. If you're feeling, you know, your husband isn't paying enough attention to you lately or he's neglecting the house, that, those things can be frustrating. But I, I'm here to encourage you to be patient and even encouraging and, and talk about it honestly with him. Um, but give him that time. Because the father might be having him out in the wilderness for a time to prepare him for the next um, amazing kingdom work that he's going to do for the kingdom. And you want to be helping him. Um, you want to be a part of that. Not, um, You don't want to hold him back from that. And sometimes we like to think that the father always tells a husband and wife the same thing at the same time. So they're always in agreement. And if they both hear the same still small voice saying the same message, then it's a go. It doesn't always happen like that. If the father is speaking to him and telling him to study like this, maybe you're not feeling it, but, but go with it. Let him have that extra time. And then when you are together, make the most of it. When he has time for you, don't be on your phone. Don't watch. Don't waste that time watching TV. Do something meaningful together. And it doesn't have to always be Bible study. Do something fun. <laughs> Go on a date. Enjoy your Shabbats. Be with other people. Grow together, but respect that his journey might be on a slightly different path for a time, especially if he's coming to Torah. That's a powerful thing for a man, I think. Um, it's they, they want to lead their families right and that's a huge responsibility and us women feel that differently we don't feel it the same way um and that's not to say that our journeys are less important that is not what i mean but as the head of the family when a man makes a decision about where he's going to shepherd his, which direction he's going to go with, with his shepherding that's that is and it should be heavy on his shoulders it's the responsibility that's different um, not the value. <laughs> We're not less valuable than men. Um, but the responsibility is heavy on his shoulders because that's the design. And so honor and respect that and be ready to help him by giving him that time. Your role in this, in him coming to Torah, is vital. And it's not the preachy kind. <laughs> it might be when he comes to you with questions, you can, I guess, preach a little and tell him what you think and show him scriptures. But it's, it's supporting and helping. And I know it's hard. It'll be hard. These things were hard, you know. It was hard when the power went out. It was hard when church was canceled over and over and the kids were antsy and they missed their Awana friends. And um, certainly Anne's illness was hard. And the people who had layoffs, that was challenging. But I think we all look back on it and we say, thank you, Father, for, this, for the tremendous disruption. <laughs> because it was one of the best things you ever did for me. So I hope that encourages and helps you sisters, and I will see you on the next podcast. Bye.